this is my third visit here. And the people at Answers in Genesis asked me, how did you get invited back the third time? <laughs> and my answer is simple. This is the most discerning congregation in America. I mean, you folks really have it together, right? Anyway, should a Christian in this modern age actually care about the book of Genesis? Now, obviously, I think so. You see, I work with a ministry called Answers in Genesis. I mean, we think it's very important. It's foundational. And if we're going to spend this entire session just talking about the book of Genesis, the most obvious place to start would be First Chronicles. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. But I'm, I'm, have, I'm having a great time. If you're not, it's on you. I mean, I can't have And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times. I submit in this day and age, the church... has a wonky projector on one side. Uh, you can look at that screen. It works better. Um, that's not good. Huh. I'll try it one more time. Well, it ain't me. We'll see how long that lasts. I mean, let's see. We'll go to this slide. and that, Okay, well, at least we're there. Well, it's... Is it just me or is that... Yeah, it's... The, it's trying. Okay, this screen's like really good. Look at this screen over here, okay? I got 45 minutes. I just lost three major points here. Right? I submit that the church in this day and age no longer has understanding of the times. Now, when I say church, I mean church in the global sense. Certainly, I'm not talking about any particular church. There are churches out there that boldly and unashamedly stand on the authority of, of, of the Word of God. They're boldly proclaiming Christ. But I'm just going to tell you, those churches are in the minority. The church that I attended as a teenager, the church where I was baptized when I was 17, the church where I served as deacon for several years has said publicly, Tommy is not welcome to come speak here. Because we don't want to hear anything about what they call that nonsense. You know what the nonsense is that I preach and teach? God's Word's true from the very first verse. I mean, why would a church care about a message like that, right? At the root of the whole mischief of these last days lies disbelief in the Bible as the Word of God. This is the fundamental error. Folks, I preach and teach all over the world, and what I will tell you is this is absolutely true. Everywhere I go, I see churches that have compromised the authority of God's Word. Psalm 11, 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know that every major doctrine in Christianity, directly or, in, or indirectly, Find its way back to the book of Genesis. You want to truly understand sin? Where do you have to start? Okay, folks, work with me here. These are easy questions. You get the easy ones, I'll do the hard ones, okay? And if I ask a question, if you say yes or Genesis, you've got 95% of them. There will be the occasional trick question. You have to look at the slide. If that one's not working, you can look at this one. But the thing is, just read the slide. These are easy questions. You want to understand sin, you have to go back to the foundation. You have to go back to Genesis. Let me show you how this works. Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What are you talking about? Jesus died for our sins. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. No, don't you get it? We're all sinners. Hey, don't you get it? I'm a good person. No, 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 we're all sinners. Hey, I'm a good person. You ever had that kind of conversation with people? I go round and round with people about stuff like that. You know what the problem is? People out in the world, they actually think they're good. <laughs> yeah, Charles Darwin wrote about that. He says his evolution progresses. Man's going to reach closer and closer to what he calls perfection. 
And folks, there is a source of authority out in the world to convince people they're good. You know what that source of authority is? Satan. Okay. I, say, I was going to say eBay. That's the same thing. <laughs> Anybody ever shopped on eBay? I bought some priceless junk. I mean treasures on eBay. If you go to eBay's policy page, it says this. We believe people are basically good. Now, I don't know who else is shopping on eBay, but the people I know that shop on eBay are wretched sinners in need of a Savior. Think of the one I see in the mirror every day, right? But the thing is, how do you convince somebody who thinks they're good, they're sinners in need of a Savior? You have to go back to the foundation. You have to go back to Genesis. And I'm going to ask the next question. This is not intended to be a trick question. It's really not. Because I think if you'd asked me this question when I was in the second grade, I would have gotten it right. But somehow the last 10 or 15 years, our academics, our intellectuals, our legislators, they seem to be really struggling with what even today seems to me to be a simple question. So I'm going to ask you, what is marriage? Where did you get that idea? Where in the Bible? But you can't use Genesis. See, that's what most churches will tell you. Genesis is myth, fable, fairy tale. We now know enough to know what God meant as opposed to what he plainly said. And folks, you know what that is? That is the definition of arrogance. God, I know what you directly tell me in your word, but I'm now smart enough to know what you meant. I'm going to give you a very practical example. As you say, one day next week, I get through at the office, and I come home, and I'm talking to my wife, and I'm telling her about my day, and she's telling me about what she did, and we're having a conversation, and she looks at me, and she says, Tommy, whatever. She directly tells me something. My wife directly speaks to me. I then say, honey, I heard what you said, but this is what you meant. Guys, you're sitting next to your wives and you're afraid to say anything, you big cowards. Okay, yeah. You see where we're headed here. This has disaster written all over it, right? A, my wife speaks to me. B, I then directly reinterpret what my wife said. There is no scenario where C works out in my favor. This is going to be ugly. Now, we can laugh about that because I just reinterpreted what my wife said. I just did it to my spouse. Think about the consequences of doing it to the creator God of the universe. God, you're not able to directly communicate with me, and I'm now smart enough to know what you meant. So, folks, if you can reinterpret Genesis, you can reinterpret marriage. Here's a question. Why do we wear clothes? But I'm a doctor. I know why people need to wear clothes. I don't have to be convinced we live in a fallen, cursed world. I totally get it, right? You see, God gave us clothing as a covering for sin. What about the effects of the curse? What about the seven-day week? Here's one. 1 Corinthians 15.45. Who's the last Adam? There's the last of something. Doesn't it make sense? There's a... You read about the first Adam where? See, it all kind of fits together, right? Let me show you practically how this works. You want to understand sin? You have to go back to the beginning. You have to go back to Genesis. God created everything in how long? Six days. Six ordinary 24-hour days. He looked at his creation and said it was what? When God says something's very good, how good is it? It's very... See, that's one of those trick questions. You got it right away. I'm really proud of you. It's very good. In this perfect, very good paradise, what did God give man and the animals to eat? Plants. Genesis 1, 29 and 30. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which the fruit of a tree-yielding seed to you it shall be for meat, to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I've given every green herb for meat. And it was so. In the beginning, man and the animals were vegetarian. What did that mean? I mean, Adam and Eve didn't have a barbecue. T-Rex didn't try to eat Adam and Eve. The lion didn't eat the lamb. In this perfect, very good paradise, people didn't kill animals for food. Animals didn't rip each other up for food. In this perfect, very good paradise, plants only. Why is it important to understand that? It's very important. There's no animal death in the garden. In this perfect, very good paradise, plants only. Now, 
Having said that, do I promote a vegetarian lifestyle? No, thank you, I do. <laughs> Would you like proof? Okay. <laughs> you folks in the back got to, you get to get to the, the, any meal that does not involve ketchup and or A1 sauce, there is no point to the exercise. <laughs> None whatsoever. Do not bring me a plate of grass and tell me that's food. Salad ain't food. Salad is what you play with while they're cooking your food. Like if you pretend to eat this, I will then bring you food. I'm going to show you the most important verse in all of Scripture. This is my life verse. Genesis 9-3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb I have given you all things. Can I get an amen for Genesis 9-3? Without Genesis 9-3, I don't eat. But you see, it's not until after the flood we're given the biblical okay to eat meat. In the beginning, plants only. It's very important to understand that. Now, in this perfect, very good paradise, is God still in control? Is He still in authority? Sure He is. If He's in authority, are there rules? Yeah, be fruitful and multiply. There were things they were to do. There was something they're not supposed to do. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt what? How serious is our sin in the face of a holy, righteous God? It makes us worthy of death. This is the worst day in human history. This is where God's perfect paradise is broken. Who broke it? We did. Right? I mean, they were the perfect representatives of humankind. They made the same choice we would have made. God, we don't like your rules. We don't like your authority. We want to live the way we want to live. You know what God said? Fine. But there's a consequence to that choice. Death is here. This perfect creation is now broken. Now Adam and Eve have a huge problem. In that sinful state, can they have fellowship with a holy, righteous God? No. Is there anything of their own hands they can do to restore that fellowship? Did they try? Was this adequate? No. No. Was this comfortable? No. Was this poison ivy? I say no because to this point nobody's given me a reason there would be poison ivy in the garden. But nonetheless, we know this was not adequate. How do we know that? Hebrews 9.22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. What had to happen? Sacrifice. Genesis 3.21. Unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. How do you get coats of skin? You have to have a dead animal or a very cooperative animal. There is no third choice. Adam and Eve clothed with coats of skin, the first animal sacrifice. Why are we sinners in need of a Savior? I know your answer, but you've got to go back to the foundation. You've got to go back to Genesis. So Tommy, let me get this straight. You're seriously going to stand there. All those years of college, all that scientific education, all those letters after your name, practice medicine for all those years, all that scientific background, you're seriously going to tell me Genesis is real history? That's exactly what I'm going to tell you. Genesis 1 to 11 is the true history of the world. But you know what you should do with my opinion, or Ken Ham's opinion, or Dr. George Purden's opinion, Dr. Jason Lyle's opinion, Dr. Andrew Snelling's opinion? You know what you should do with all those opinions? You should just throw them out. Because why should you care what we think? But folks, I really believe there are people in history who've earned the right to be heard. You know who said Genesis was history? <laughs> Paul did. Romans 5.12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Is that a true statement? Yeah. You bet it is. In my home church, we call that good preaching. My pastor would get a hold of that verse and he'll go about four weeks on that one verse. <laughs> By the time he gets done, we'll be so excited. We'll be throwing babies up in the air. That's good <laughs> preaching right there. Can somebody relate this verse to the book of Genesis for me? That one man was who? 
You read about Adam where? So Paul, under the inspiration of God, said there was a one man who sinned to bring death. You read about that one man in Genesis. So if Genesis isn't real history, you know what Romans 5.12 is? It's a lie. We thought the book of Genesis, we now reinterpret the book of Romans. You see, there's a disconnect. The problem in this day and age, the church does not understand the issue. The church no longer understands the time. The church says, it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis. It's, not a, it's just a side issue. You can believe in the millions of years. You can believe in the days. It doesn't matter. None of that makes any difference to the rest of the doctrine. The church doesn't get it. And I'm going to go one step further with this. I'm going to suggest to you that a proper understanding of the cross requires you to properly understand this verse. Oh, Tommy, you people that answers in Genesis, you're so rigid, you're so fundamental. You say that people don't believe exactly like you do. They can't even be saved. They can't even be Christian. And folks, there is a reason to believe that. Because Romans 10, 9 clearly says this. If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead and believe in a young earth in six literal days, you'll be saved. From the new, new revised standard version, by the way. Is that what it says? Of course not. Faith in Christ alone is what saves. It's never been our position this is a salvation issue. This is an issue of biblical authority. Folks, I was saved when I was 17. For the next 15 years of my life, I was a theistic evolutionist. The church I attended back in those days, the pastor believed in evolution in the millions of years. That's what I was taught. I was taught to weave evolution into my thinking about God's Word. My spiritual mentors at the time when I was just a baby Christian, that's what they taught me. So for 15 years, I was a theistic evolutionist. It was years later when I got into serious Bible study, I came to understand that theistic evolution is a totally inadequate theology. It's not supportable. But you know something? I'm no more saved today than I was when I was 17. I'd like to think my understanding of Scripture is more mature. I have a more sound, logical defense of the faith. This is not a salvation issue. It's an issue of biblical authority. Unfortunately, in this day and age, it's an issue that the church says doesn't matter. As I said, the church no longer has understanding of the times. You know who does understand the times? The secular world does. It becomes clear now the whole justification of Jesus' life and death is predicated on the existence of Adam and the forbidden fruit he and Eve ate. Without the original sin, who needs to be redeemed? Without Adam's fall to a life of constant sin, terminated by death, what purpose is there to Christianity? None. This was written by an atheist named Richard Bozarth. He points out, church, you don't get it. Church, you're inconsistent. Church, you preach your Christ crucified and resurrected. And yet, church, I read that Romans 5, 12 verse. It says, hey, church, let me show you something else I found in your Bible." 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Church, you preach your Christ crucified and resurrected, but church, you believe in evolution in the millions of years. Church, you're inconsistent. You know what that charge against the church is, by the way? It's absolutely correct. Richard Bozoff points out the following. He says, church, if you don't believe the days in Genesis are ordinary days, you must believe in the millions of years. It says, church, if you believe in the millions of years, you must believe in evolution. It says, church, if you believe in evolution, you must believe that man evolved from ape-like creatures over the last three to five million years. It says, church, if man evolved from ape-like creatures over the last three to five million years, you know what Adam and Eve are? They're a myth. It says, church, if Adam and Eve are a myth, there's no original sin. It says, church, if there's no original sin, why did your Jesus go to the cross? How come the world gets it and the church seemingly has no clue? And let me say this. I don't want you to read. Do not read into this that I'm saying it's a salvation. I'm not remotely suggesting that. What I'm saying to you directly is this. If the days in Genesis are not ordinary days, I challenge you to bring me the New Testament and tell me why Jesus went to the cross. There's a disconnect. And I'm going to show you now the thing that more than any other causes people to doubt the Word of God. And folks, I've been thinking about this for the last 30 years, and I believe this is absolutely true. The thing that more than any other causes people to doubt the authority of God's Word, rocks. Yeah, I don't get it either, okay? I'm a life sciences guy. I like things that are squishy and things you can dissect. To me, there's nothing more useless than a rock. If I say something as dull as a box of rocks, that's dull, okay? 
You see those rocks? You know what they do? Nothing. If I put a rock right here and we watched it for an hour, you know what it would do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. If I left that rock here and I came back in five years and we all gathered around and looked at that rock, you know what it would have done over those five years? Nothing. You know what causes people to doubt the Word of God? Those rocks. You know why? They're obviously millions of years old. Anybody here been to the Grand Canyon? I've been on five rafting trips down the Grand Canyon. And I'm just going to tell you, that's the deepest hole a boy from Tennessee ought to ever find himself in. We don't have, that's the biggest hole I ever thought of. We don't have holes like that in Tennessee. But you go down the, down the river with these secular geologists and say, Tommy, your Bible's not true. See those rocks? Those rocks are obviously millions of years old. We've done tests on some of those rocks. Those rocks are obviously millions of years old. Your Bible's not true. Folks, I want to ask you a question. What's obvious about those rocks? They're rocks. Again, if I ask a question, if you do this, you've overthought it. <laughs> go with your first instinct. What's obvious about those rocks? They're rocks. What does an old rock look like? A rock. See, you're catching on right away. What does a young rock look like? A rock. What's the difference between an old rock and a young rock? They're rocks. But what the world says is these rock layers were laid down by slow processes over hundreds of millions of years. They are, in fact, the physical geologic proof that the earth is millions of years old. And most Christians, including me at one time in my life, accept that. And Christian, if you believe those rocks are the physical geologic proof that the earth is millions of years old, you've got a huge problem. You know what your problem is called? It's called fossils. Because you know what you find in many of those rock layers? You find fossils. Fossils are the remains of what? Dead things. To become a fossil, first thing you've got to be is dead. The rest of it ain't too hard. I mean, you get dead, you get covered up, you're going to fall. So if the rocks were laid down by slow processes over hundreds of millions of years, then they are, in fact, the physical geologic proof that the earth is millions of years old. The fossil record would be the physical geologic proof of millions of years of what? Death. Oh, Adam is such a perfect world. Yes, Eve, it's very good, like God said. That's what God's Word tells us. You've got to make yourself believe this is what God's Word means. You know, God said he created in six days. He, he, did, he said day, but he meant millions of years. It's one of those sort of poetry allegory things. So in the first book of, in Genesis 1, it says six days, but he meant six long geologic time periods. And after he got through with all this creative activity, he looked on everything he created and said it was very good. In that scenario, then including all these rocks and all these fossils. You know what you find in the fossil record? You find evidence of animals have eaten each other, animals have ripped each other up, bone disease, arthritis, infectious disease. We find fossil evidence of brain tumors. You're telling me the creator God of the universe called brain tumors very good? I don't think so. And guess what? That's not where your problem ends. Let's just say the millions of years are true and evolution's true. We did evolve from ape-like creatures over the last three to five million years. The millions of years are true. At this point, at some point, God turns to Adam and says this, Adam... Don't do that, or you're going to die. If the millions of years are true, what would Adam's logical response be? So what? I'm going to die anyway. You see, if death were already here, how could death be the punishment for man's disobedience? How could Christ's death on the cross be the atonement for our sin? You've got a huge theologic disconnect. And again, this issue is what the, so many in the church say. It's not important. It's a society issue. It doesn't matter church no longer has understanding of the times. The thing you have to grasp is this. If you believe in evolution in the millions of years, there's something that's always been here. You know what that something is? Death. If evolution's true, you know what is an absolute requirement? Death. Evolution has been called the religion of death. Without death, evolution does not progress. I mean, what's the process that makes evolution go? Survival of the fittest. And this is an easy concept to wrap your mind around. You know, strong creatures survive, weak creatures fall by the wayside. For example, in Africa, who lives longer? Fast gazelles or slow ones? <laughs> Fast ones. Slow ones become lunch. See, this is not hard. And what the evolutionists would say is over me millions of years through processes of natural selection and mutations, the gazelles, you know, the pressures will cause the gazelle to become something else. Well, folks, the only thing... The gazelles have in their DNA is the DNA to make gazelles. But nonetheless, you know, 
If you believe in the millions of years, death has always been here. God's word's clear. He created a perfect creation where there was no death. Man's disobedience brought death. And the church continues to say, it doesn't matter, it's a side issue. As I continue to say, the church no longer has understanding of the times. Because you know who sees this? Our young people do. Barna's group, they've done lots of surveys over the years, and they've come up with some fascinating information. About 10 years ago, they did a big survey, and what they found is that young people growing up in Christian homes, when they reach adulthood, 70% of those young people don't go to church. About a year after Barna's first survey, Lifeway came out with a survey. It's up to 80%. I've talked to pastors all over the country. They tell me, Tommy, our young people are walking away in record numbers. What's the problem? Well, a few years ago, we published this book. It's called Already Gone. And along with Britt Beamer and America's Research Group, we surveyed 1,000 young people, ages 20 to 29, who don't go to church anymore, but who did when they were young. And there were two questions, two issues we wanted to explore. When did you decide to walk away, and what was the reason you decided to walk away? Well, if you'd asked us 10 years ago, Tommy, when did our young people walk away from church, we would have said high school and college. You know, their faith is being formally and intellectually challenged. Well, high school and college is still an important time. The thing that shocked us was this. How about elementary and middle school? In our survey group, by the end of middle school, 43% of those who walked away had either already decided they were going to or already having serious doubts. Imagine, at that early age, there was nothing about the church that was important. The Bible's a book of myths, fables, fairy tales, and I'm not going to participate in this activity when I don't have to. Now, to be fair, at that age, they're still coming, you know, because mom and daddy are dragging them. Statistically speaking, though, go to any church in America, line up all the young people down front, 80% of those young people are already gone. Folks, if that doesn't frighten you, it should. The number one reason our young people walk away, and this makes sense when you hear it, but this is what the statistics tell us. The number one reason our young people walk away, nobody answered my questions. What's the issue in the church in this day and age? We've got so many church leaders, we've got so many of our Christian academics, our seminary professors saying, we've somehow got to turn, come to terms, we've got to make peace with man's view of origins. We've got to accommodate evolution in our understanding and our interpretation of the Bible, which is complete nonsense. Because you know what evolution is at its core? It's a way to explain how we got here without God. It's a man-centered, materialist, secularist view of origins. It's a way to explain how we got here without God. As I said before, for 15 years, I was a theistic evolutionist. I was taught that God created and used evolution. You know what the unnecessary part of my theology was? God. Because God really didn't do anything. He gets some credit for creating something, and over billions of years, everything kind of created itself. The superfluous part of my theology was God. Guess what? If you've got a view of origins that basically says there is no God, everything created itself, what do you need God for? It's the unfortunate part is, the majority of people in, in the church in this day and age say we've somehow got to, got to come to grips with this. We've got to weave our man's view of origins into our interpretation or understanding of the Bible. Otherwise, the secular world is not going to consider us intelligent. They're not going to consider us scientific. They're not going to consider us intellectual. Well, guess what, folks? You're more concerned about what man says or what God says. There's a disconnect in the church in this day and age. And this whole rush to accommodate evolution is really unfortunate because... You know who says that kind of thinking is wrong? The evolutionists do. And was there a particular point that, or something that you read or an experience you had that sort of said, yeah, this is it, God doesn't exist? Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. Um, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing uh, evolution as the enemy. Um, Whereas the more, what should we say, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution, I think they're deluded. And I think the, I think the evangelicals have got it right uh, in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. And I think I realized that at the age of about 60. The person being interviewed here is Richard Dawkins who well, I think can fairly be characterized as the world's leading spokesperson for evolution. He says these sophisticated theologians who try to weave evolution and Christianity together, he says they're deluded. you got the vast majority of Christian academics and Christian leaders saying we've somehow got to weave these two ideas together. you got the world's leading evolutionists saying they don't even remotely go together. There's a disconnect. The church no longer has understanding of the time. So let's see what happens when a young person is taught evolution. 
story of how I became an atheist. I was born into a Christian family and indoctrinated as uh, growing up as a kid. That next year was freshman year of high school, and I started learning about evolution in my biology class. Then uh, that's where I realized I had never seriously questioned or thought about my religious beliefs. So as I learned about evolution and just started thinking philosophically about it, I realized that there couldn't be a god. So I became an atheist. What happened to this young man? He got taught evolution, and he then accepted that as the appropriate worldview. What he did next was logical. He says there is no God. Because after all, if evolution's true, it's a way to explain how we got here without God. What do you need God for? So he made a logical decision. Now, did you hear what he said to start with? I was raised in a Christian home, and I was indoctrinated. Did you hear him use that word? First few times I saw this clip that kind of bothered me, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, that's exactly what happened. I can just imagine this scene in his home. Bible says it, just believe it. Bible says it, just believe it. Bible says it, just believe it. Folks, if the Bible says it, I believe it. Don't get me wrong. But when you say the Bible says it, just believe it to a 14-year-old, they've got the most annoying question. Why? The Bible says it, just believe it. You know what that is? That's indoctrination. You know what answering the why is? That's called apologetics. The thing is, the world is great at apologetics. By that I mean they're great at giving young people answers to defend that particular worldview. The church is lousy at apologetics. Who's told us that? All the young people have walked away. What's their number one complaint? You didn't answer my question. Well, it doesn't matter. Just love Jesus. Folks, it does matter. These foundational issues have caused so many of our young people to walk away because they think Christianity is not an intellectual worldview, an, an intellectual basic belief system. They think it's just, you know, take it by faith, there's, there's no basis to it, which is complete nonsense. Now think about this, and again, I'm going to use the, the term church, I mean church in the global sense. By and large, when young people come to church, what are they taught? No, they're taught Bible stories. They're taught, you know, Jesus fed the 5,000, Paul's missionary journey. They're taught Bible stories. Is that Noah's Ark? you got a 50-50 chance. Is that Noah's Ark? Yes, it is. The reason I know that, the giraffes are sticking out the top. Ain't no giraffes, ain't Noah's Ark. That's just the rule to go by. And the reason I know that is the vast majority of churches I speak in, and again, these are solid Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching churches that invite us in to say, I want you to help equip our people to have answers. They can stand on the authority of the Word of God. These are solid Bible-preaching churches. This is, by and large, what I see in the kids' area. The overstuffed houseboat with a giraffe sticking out the top and the monkey on the porthole and the guy with a long white beard and a butterfly net. As many times as I've read through the Word of God, I have yet to come across a description of anything remotely like that. But you see, if we're really lucky, we get a little Johnny one morning a week. If it's a very dedicated family, you get him every other Wednesday night, it's no soccer practice. So he comes in to Sunday school and we whip some juice and cookies on him. Okay, little Johnny, we're going to equip you today. We're going to edify you. We're going to educate you. We're going to teach you something out of God's Word. Oh, how about Noah's Ark? Oh, the overstuffed houseboat with a giraffe sticking out the top and the guy with a long white beard and a butterfly net and the monkey on the porthole. Oh, isn't it really funny? Thank you, Miss Sunday School teacher. I really feel equipped. I'm emboldened. I'm empowered to go out in the world and stand boldly on the authority of the Word of God. I'll see you next week. Now, where's little Johnny go the rest of the week? Out into the world. Where's he attacked? Pretty much everywhere. Movies, books, TV, school books. Hey, little Johnny, there's no way you fit all those animals on the ark. And the thing is, as I've shared with the other session, this tends to be a particular favorite question of astrophysicists. Because I've spoken to a lot of colleges and universities over the last 30 years, and a lot of these guys will challenge me, well, Tom, first of all, if you say you believe the Bible, you know, you're not even remotely scientific. But, Tom, are you going to stand there with a straight face and say you actually believe this fairy tale about Noah's Ark? Tommy, you've obviously taken biology classes. There are millions of species of animals in the world. There's no way you can get millions of animals on Noah's Ark. Now, what's our response to that? We agree. What do you mean you agree? Just ruined that man's whole day. There's nothing upsets an evolutionist more than when you agree with them. What do you mean you don't need? You need two of every kind, seven of some. So you don't need 354 varieties of dogs. How many dogs are on Noah's Ark? Two. How many turtles are on Noah's Ark? Two. How many cats are on Noah's Ark? I know that absolutely too many. <laughs> I do believe that's scriptural, and I stand behind my interpretation. But nonetheless, you get the idea. So you don't need millions of animals. You need maybe five to 7,000 total animals, you know, 
overall. Problem little Johnny's got, he can get about 16 animals on that toy boat before it sinks. He can't even remotely come to the right answer. Hey, those rock layers were laid down over millions of years. A global flood would be impossible. Noah's flood's a myth. Hey, where all that water come from? Johnny, your Bible's not true. Well, Johnny gets to church the next week, and it's safe to say he's had a tough week. There's no doubt about it. Okay, we whipped some juice and cookies on him. He said, okay, we're going to teach you some more out of God's Word today. And his hand goes up and says, okay, Miss Sunday's going to teach you. I'm sorry. I know we've got to get to the lesson. I know time's limited. But, you know, about 37 things came up this week. I'm really struggling with some of the stuff you taught me. I'm really kind of, I'm, I'm trying to make this feel. I'm, having, I'm really having a problem here. And we don't answer his questions. You know what we do? We teach him another story, this time about the big fish. Then you know what we tell him? Just trust in Jesus. Well, Johnny's going to get older. You know what he's going to realize? Nobody ever answered my questions. I'm out of here. I mean, why did we go to the trouble to build a full-size Noah's Ark in Kentucky, the Ark Encounter? Why did we build the Creation Museum? To equip people to have answers to the questions of the age. Not only to answer the skeptical questions of the secular world, but to answer the questions where we failed our young people. We've not equipped them. To fill in those gaps. I mean, how many young people have come to me and asked about how big Noah's Ark was? How did you get the animals on? What about dinosaurs? That's what we do at our ministries. And it is so necessary because, like I said to start with, the church no longer has understanding of the times. The church does not think this is important. It's a side issue. And again, the people who have told us it is important are the people who have walked away. Let's look at the other side of this coin. Where's little Johnny go to learn real things? You know, real biology, real geology, real chemistry. School. 89% of children in churches around the country go to public school. If you homeschool Christian school or private school and think you're safe, you are so mistaken. You should see some of the curriculums out there and some of the curriculum is coming. Well, little Johnny goes to school and learn real science like this. Fourteen and a half billion years ago, nothing exploded. I'm going to give that a minute to sink in. Folks, I don't care who you are, that's deep. First there was nothing, then it exploded. And those people say we have faith. Now what's going to happen about 9.30 nights, you're going to be walking through your living room, you're going to go, wow, I finally figured it out. First there was nothing. That's called science. That's the predominant view of the secular world. There was nothing, then there was something, and everything created itself, which is creative to say the least. And if you talk to as many theoretical physicists as I, as I have, just seeing the, the, the phrase Big Bang gives me an immediate headache. You know, so these, these are some very creative ways that there can be nothing, then there's something. Because these people say that we understand the way the world works based on the laws of physics and chemistry and everything, you know, that we are things that we've been able to understand. And the reason you're able to understand those things, by the way, is there's an orderly creator God who put into place an orderly universe where everything operates according to, you know, appropriate laws and patterns and things that we can see and measure and understand. Well, these people say we understand how matter works, so we understand how things came to be. Oh, really? The first law of thermodynamics says this. Matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed one form to the other. Simply put, you can't get something from nothing. Except in the beginning. <laughs> Biology books say life only comes from life. Life doesn't come from non-life. Except in the beginning. You see, the secularists have to consistently violate their own worldview to make their worldview work. Folks, I have absolutely no problem understanding where matter came from. I have a personal relationship with the only one who can create from nothing. Or will Johnny go to school and learn some life sciences stuff? Has anybody in this room never seen an illustration or diagram, something like this? This is telling us that we evolved from ape-like creatures over the last three to five million years, right? You know, we were sort of knuckle-dragging and semi-upright then my mother-in-law, then fully human. And that's how we got here. How much fossil evidence is there to support that? None. If you take the fossils and sort them, you find things are fully ape, things are fully human. And my wife is here, by the way, so I'm, if, I don't see, if, I, if I'm not here for the evening session, I love you guys. Uh, anyway, so... You, things fossil have fossils are fully ape or fully human. See, there are no transitional forms. There are no missing links. I mean, when I was young, Cro Magnon man was the missing link. Now, it turned out that was human. Then Neanderthal, that's the missing link. It turned out that was human. You think they'd be out of bullets, but there's one specimen they're hanging on to for dear life. This is Grandma. 
This is Lucy. This is our earliest ancestor. And they know our earliest ancestor looked like that. You know how they know that? Because they found that. I'm convinced, aren't you? They found that and made that. But there's a consequence to making that out of that, and that consequence is that. And ladies, there's a further consequence, which is that. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that even in the church, for generations now, we've taught our kids they're just the product of evolution. You're just the product of evolution. You're just the product of evolution. Just the product of evolution. You're just an animal. You're just an animal. You're just an animal. We've taught our kids for generations they're just animals, and now we complain when they act like animals. <laughs> Folks, we're not animals. We're made in the image of the living God. And folks, as much as the church wants to push this issue to the side, as much as the church in this day and age said this is a side issue, doesn't matter, leave whatever you want to, it is foundational to every doctrine in Christianity. And those who have walked away have consistently now told us, the reason I walked away is I had these questions and nobody answered them. I want answers. Folks, our young people deserve answers. The church needs to step back and say, we need to do a better job of equipping our young people to have answers to the questions of the age. And folks, according to Scripture, this is not even optional. Scripture tells us this, 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason to hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Folks, that's what Answers in Genesis Ministries is about. It's about coming along beside every parent and grandparent, every person, every church pew around the world, every pastor, every Sunday school teacher, every church leader, every seminary professor to help them understand that we have answers. Now, do we propose that we've got every answer? No. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. There are certain things we'll never be able to answer this side of heaven. I've got a whole list of questions. If I get to heaven, man, I'm going to start checking those bad boys off because you can't, there are things we can't know. But there are a lot of things we do have answers to. And the world is so good at equipping young people to have answers to, to support their worldview. Why is the church so bad at it? Well, we just don't want to deal with these things. I've had so many people tell me, well, we shouldn't be talking about dinosaurs in church. We shouldn't be talking about carbon-14 in church. We shouldn't be talking about Jesus. Really? You know, those who walked away would disagree with you. Because you know where you find the message of salvation? You find them in the pages of God's Word. But the secular world says that's a book of myths, fables, fairy tales. We need to be about the business of equipping our young people to be able to stand confidently, boldly, and unashamedly on the authority of the Word of God.